This is Anthony in Areno, and you're listening to In the Arena. I'm fascinated by ideas and how ideas spread. In 1995, I walked past a book called The Lucifer Principle, A Scientific Expedition into the Forces of History by Howard Bloom. I picked up the book and bought it, and it affected me deeply. It's a book about science and history, and for my money, it's about a whole lot more. I emailed the author, Howard Bloom, and we've been friends ever since. Howard is a polymath. He's a scientist. He's a writer. He's a great thinker. And at one point, he ran the largest PR firm in the music industry, managing acts like Prince, Michael Jackson, ZZ Top, Aerosmith, and John Cougar Mellencamp. I asked Howard to explain memes, how ideas spread, how we successfully sell our ideas, what is influence and what is charisma, and I asked him how he sold artists like John Cougar Mellencamp. I've known Howard for a long time, so he calls me by my first name, Sam. With uh, that being said, here is the incomparable Howard Bloom. And we're off. So here's the the first thing. So of all okay, the correct. things that I've read in, in 1995, probably the greatest impact on my thinking and, and how my thinking developed, especially at that time and then beyond, was The Lucifer Principle, your first book. And I was introduced to the idea of memes there. And so I, if you could, could you tell us what memes are and how they work? And then I want to ask a follow up question on okay, do we is, do we choose the infection or does the infection choose us? Oh, my God. That's a good one. OK, well, here we go. Memes is a concept that comes from Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins is an absolutely brilliant zoologist um, from Oxford who writes books like The Selfish Gene. The Selfish Gene, by the way, was a landmark book. And The Selfish Gene was the book that contained the concept of the meme. And basically, it goes something like this. Um, in biology, we have replicators. We have molecules. The origin of life came about with molecules that grew very, very big. They were atomic. Well, now we're talking bloom terms. But they were atomic assemblies. They were like atomic uh, communities, huge atomic communities of millions of atoms. And working together, these millions of atoms managed to make copies of themselves. And they, uh, they presumably started off in, in uh, sat in chemically saturated pools, and they rapidly grabbed all the chemicals they could around them and turned those chemicals into more copies of themselves. Well, Richard Dawkins says that that happened about three, roughly four billion years ago, just a short time after the planet formed. And um, then, somewhere in the last two and a half million to 30,000 years, a new form of replicator came along, a new thing capable of making copies of itself. But the first form of replicator depended on being matter to make copies of itself. It was a molecule. It was a molecule of DNA, RNA. It was a complete chromosome with lots of uh, genes attached. I mean, first of all, he... Dawkins got it a little bit wrong. He talked about selfish genes, but no gene is an island. Genes cannot live on their own. Genes can only live in packs. In the same way that a gene is a pack of atoms working together, um, a genome is a pack of genes working together. And the smallest genomes we know are around 400 genes in size. So unless you've got a team of 400 or more genes, nothing's going to happen. There is no replication. But what uh, Dawkins saw was that we have these new replicators. They're ideas. And an idea which needs no material, yes, it has a material substance for a brief nanosecond or picosecond or femtosecond of time, but then it moves on to other matter very, very quickly. So in a sense, it has no matter in the brain, and yet it can hop from my mind to yours. And examples are catchy tunes that we simply can't get out of our mind at all. 
And what is a tune becoming a hit? It's the process of that tune jumping from mind to mind to mind, to use Bloomian vocabulary, seducing, kidnapping, and recruiting, mind after mind after mind, until it has several hundred million of them all at a time. And some of them try to repulse this tune because it soon becomes loathsome to some who can't believe that it's stuck in their mind. And it doesn't matter, Sam. You can try to get it out by whatever means you choose, and it just won't get out of there. But memes, ideas, uh, these uh, which have been compared to virus viruses in terms of their infect- ability to infect minds, um, they include the very concept of language, the very concept of the first stone tool, the first stone tool was made 2.5 million years ago. The concept of the first stone tool was so catchy that it caught off wherever there were human beings 2.5 million years ago, or proto-human beings. And, but it caught on in exactly the same form. And the, the concept of the stone tool was so uh, resistant to change that our stone tool stayed the same for 750,000 years, three quarters of a million years. The most interesting memes that Richard, pointed, Richard Dawkins pointed to in The Selfish Gene are religious ideas. And these are ideas that not only have the ability to infect your mind, but then they prevent you from kicking them out. How do they prevent you from kicking them out? Not just being catchy the way that a tune is, but by, but by saying, if you kick me out, you are in for really big trouble, buddy. There's a heaven and there is a hell. And when you die, you either go to heaven or hell, and they're eternal. And if you kick me out, you will go to hell and will experience torment for infinity. If you manage to hold on to me tightly and in precisely the right way, you may make it to heaven. So ideas came up with enforcement mechanisms, ways of keeping you from kicking them out. And those ideas with enforcement mechanisms that keep you from kicking them out are, tend to be religions, but not always, because science, and, and we're moving from Dawkins now, um, very much moving from Dawkins, because Dawkins turned his science into a religion and didn't know it. Um, for example, um, he believed in something called individual selectionism, that your each gene is out for its own guts and glory, and that's it, it's out for its own booty, well, no, Richard, don't, haven't you ever seen a genome, for God's sakes? Don't you know that a genome is one giant molecule with 400 genes in it? None of those genes can live on its own. No gene is an island. You got it wrong, Richard. No, Richard con- continued with this idea that it's loners out for themselves that determine the course of evolution. And there's, you know, I've spent four books worth. Um, giving evidence that he's wrong, that actually there's something called group selection, and groups compete. And my books point out that you've got in human history, if you want to understand human history, you have to understand a trio of things. And the triad, the trio, the trinity um, of the Lucifer Principle, the first book, is ideas, superorganisms, and um, the pecking order. Why? Because ideas hold a group together. Then groups compete with each other. What do they compete for? A position and a pecking order. What's a pecking order? Well, a guy named Sheldrup Ebb, a Swedish, um, or you can't call him a Swedish uh, zoologist and biologist, because he started this at something like the age of six, long before he was officially a zoologist and a biologist. His parents decided it was good for him to be out in the countryside among nature, you know, because nature is nice and sweet and gentle. All the things that humans in cities are, humans in cities are competitive and vicious to each other. And you you don't want a kid to experience that. So they bought a house out in the country to raise shelter of Edmund. Well, the house out in the country was near a lot of chicken, flocks of chickens that farmers were keeping all over the place. And what did Shelter have this little boy see among flocks of chickens? They they peck at each other. They peck at each other, and they do it viciously. And he eventually noticed that there was a chain of pecking. There was there were a few chickens that didn't have any peck marks at all. No one dared peck them. There was one, in fact, who no one dared peck at all. And then there were the chickens that she pecked, but nobody else dared peck. 
And then there were the chickens they pecked, but lower, lower ranking individuals did not dare peck. And then at the very bottom of the pecking order was one chicken everybody felt free to peck. And generally, it was featherless um, and a runt. It was a poor, unfortunate chicken. So did Sheldrick Ebb see kindness in nature? Did he see kindness among the chickens? chickens? No, just the opposite. He saw all of the tyrannical impulses that his parents were trying to get him away from in the city. And he started to keep notebooks, and he started to take keep track of the behavior of the chickens and how many times a chicken was pecked. And sure enough, there was an alpha chicken that didn't get pecked at all. And then there were beta chickens who got pecked only by the alpha chicken. And then there were the next rank of chickens who were pecked by the beta chickens and so on down the line. And he noticed that in keeping track, the numerical track of things, that there was also a lineup for the food. And the first one in line was also was always guess who? The dominant chicken, the alpha chicken, the no one no one dared peck. She was allowed at the pecking at the trough, the feeding trough before anybody else. Then came the beta chickens, then came the gamma chickens, then came the delta chickens, and finally the poor omega chicken on the bottom of the heap. So what he, what uh, Sheldrick Bab saw, saw was later called the dominant hierarchy. And it turned out that these dominant hierarchies are in all kinds of animals. And they appear, you know, we talk about dominant hierarchies and competition as if we've created this stuff through this hideous stuff called capitalism. Well, that's ridiculous. You've got, when the pigs are in the womb, you've got a bunch of little tiny piglets. They haven't even been born yet, Sam. They're still in their mother's body. And they're already competing in the pecking order. And the one who comes out on top, well, guess who comes out on top and is the first one at the nipple when they all come tumbling out? Well, the one who was first in the womb. There's a researcher in Italy who watched, who watched twins in the womb um, with uh, ultrasound. And what she saw as she watched these twins developing was there was a pecking order competition between these two twins. One of them ended up winning. The one who ended up winning got the living room of the womb, you know, the big space in the middle. Um, the other one got shoved off to the side. Now, when these two came popping out of the womb, one of them, when strangers walked into the room and when they were toddlers, would toddle over to the strangers with a great big smile on his face, absolutely certain that they were going to light up with smiles and love him. And the other one took off in terror, absolutely certain that these were going to eat him alive and went into a side room and slammed the door and hid. Guess which one did which? Guess what the alpha, the one who'd been alpha in the womb did? Was he the one who was highly social and went running over to greet strangers or the one who hid himself in the side room? Well, you've got it. He was the one who came running up to strangers with utter confidence in himself. You know, and the I've one who went when... hiding in a side room and slammed the door was the one who had hidden yeah, you know oh, I've really? got twin daughters, so, so you I'm, get to see this I've the gotten, ultrasound. I've gotten to see it not even the ultrasound, no. but I've gotten after to see the after they, effects. Do they come out this way? They do come out very, very different. Yeah, is is so yeah. The the and younger is one, one more who, dominant than the other was, but the one uh, who was less dominant got tired of taking crap from her sister and and eventually uh, stepped out uh, from underneath her uh, shadow. We've been trying to put her back in her shell ever since. Yes, good. These memes, do we choose right. these infections or do they choose us? Do we have any ability to control what we're infected with? Well, we have a good, this is a good question. You know that I did my field work. I started in science and, and theoretical physics and microbiology at the age of 10 and then had been in science almost all of my life, conscious life, by the time I was in my 20s and then decided to take a field trip into something I didn't know, popular culture, and eventually ended up establishing the biggest PR firm in the music industry. And as a former publicist who helped establish the careers of unknowns like Prince and Joan Jett, I can tell you, yes, it is possible to make a meme infectious and to get it to take hold. But to do it, you have to make sure that a person like you or me, us normal human beings, get to see it 330 times a year. 
And until we've seen it for the first 600 to 700 times, we don't even register its existence. And then once we've begun to register its existence, if it continues to be there on a constant basis, and if it has something that appeals to us, it's a value to us on an emotional level, not on a conscious level, um, then it may make it as a meme. Um, but speaking as an individual who now puts out um, uh, had the Howard the Humongous series on YouTube and, of course, puts out books and things like that and who doesn't have access to the kind of machinery, the attention producing machinery, the attention constructing machinery that I had access to when I was a, a publicist and had a staff of 15 people, it's considerably harder. And some things, when you don't have a huge machinery, some things do take off on their own, but very few of them. For example, the Howard the Humongous series, some of the episodes, they're 90-minute episodes, some have had as few as 45,000 hits. But one, the last time I looked, which is a couple of months ago, was up to 165,000 hits. What makes the difference? Well, the one that was up to 165,000 hits was on sex. That may have made a difference. <laughs> That's <laughs> definitely a hook. Uh, and when it comes to other things, I put out, um, I, I asked for a volunteer to make a, a uh, an animation of a concept that's in the new book, The God Problem, How a Godless Cosmos Creates. And it's the big bagel theory of the beginning, middle, and end of the universe. And it, it explains a few mysteries, like dark energy. It's the only thing out there that explains what dark energy is, how it works, and why. The only thing out there, Sam. And um, the guy who created it, then, because he had created the animation, wanted to see it get hits. So he promoted it, and he got it up to about 40 or 45,000 hits, but then it took off on its own, and he doesn't know how, though he was loath to confess that, since we all like to pretend we know how to make these things happen. And within its first two months, it got over three quarters of a million hits. Um, the last time I looked today, it's up to about 785,000 hits. Why that got 785,000 hits, and some things only get 45,000 hits? We haven't got a clue. Not a clue. If I had a big promotional machinery, a big PR apparatus like I used to have, then it would be more obvious. Um, but no. That, so, so when you go back to the question, do memes choose us? Memes come out as frequently as humans have ideas and begin to express them. That's how often memes come out. I'm, I'm well, thinking you know particularly... You have a million ideas... I'm thinking particularly about success and failure. I'm thinking it seems to me that some people pick up empowering memes and they hold on to them. And some people pick up disempowering memes and they bring a set of beliefs that don't allow them to succeed where other people pick. And you you help to manage the career of somebody like Prince. But you take somebody like Prince and it seems like he has the right set of beliefs. He picked up the right memes along the way to be able to do what he did. Is there something to that? Absolutely. Uh, you, yes, because if you are in my position, the position I used to be in, in the rock and roll business, and you're running the biggest PR firm in the music industry, and only a few years ago you not, knew nothing about pop music whatsoever. So you've learned by doing correlational studies and using techniques out of Martin Gardner's mathematical game sections and the Scientific American, how to see things other people in the music industry don't see. Because they're seeing through the cliches of the music industry, which can be self-defeating memes. Um, and one of the things that you'll notice is to make a star, you have to find a star. The person that you find has to be worthy of the 15 people that you employ all of the time. And one of the primary things is that person has to have a work ethic beyond belief. That person has to have a passion about music that is beyond belief. That has, person has to be capable of making music has to be one of those people who will make music day and night, seven days a week, no matter how hard you try to cut him or off for, from her music, who just needs to make music more than just about anything else in life, who would rather make music than eat or sleep, and sometimes than have sex, although music tends to go along <laughs> with sex. Um, so step one is the meme of uh, workaholism. Or the meme of music, because it's the love of the music that impels the workaholism. And from that point on, it's a matter of another kind of mimetic uh, 
There's a mimetic hatchery inside of each of us. We have two selves. One self is the conscious self, which thinks it's in charge and knows what's going on, but doesn't. And the other self is the non-conscious self, the self below the floorboards of the self. Well, the self below the floorboards of the self has its own approach to perceiving things and very seldom gets to express itself. But in a person who has the potential to be a superstar, it has found a way to express itself. And it expresses itself through that artist's music, through that artist's lyrics, and through that artist's dance and performance on stage. Now, those things might seem to be very conscious things, but Sam, when you sit down to write even a podcast, um, or when you sit down to write a blog, you can sit down at 2 o'clock in the afternoon in front of a blank computer screen and you wonder how the hell you've ever written a blog. You, you, uh, yes, you know you've written them in the past, but you can't, at this moment, you haven't a clue as to how they came about, and you surely know you can't one, write one today. And if you're lucky, by 4 o'clock in the afternoon, there's a blog in front of you. And if it's a really, really good day, you wonder, where the hell did that one come from? Because it seems so perfect that it wrote itself. I did that today. Well, that's what happens to a musical art. It's uh, it's very well, strange. I remember well, that's Keith, what happens to Keith Richards saying that he didn't write Satisfaction. He was just the antenna that it came through. Yeah, exactly. So if you are an artist of the kind who has the potential to be a superstar, these things come through you. On a, not all the time, one out of seven times, one out of 17 times, you sit down so often to write that it happens on a reasonably regular basis. And when you go on stage, you find that the audience's eyes, the audience is at first very self-conscious. Each member of the audience is very aware of looking hip to the people on either side of him and the people behind him. But if you are sufficiently good, you see those people in your audience lose that self-consciousness. You see their faces begin to melt to you. You see their pupils begin to dilate at, uh, at you. And it gives you, it sends you an energy from those people that goes coursing through up to something you don't know. And is then amplified in that something you don't know and sent down through you. And within minutes, on a really good night, you feel as if you are being danced on stage, as if you were a marionette being danced by a force that's bigger than you. And the, re the, the normal use steps aside. You can even have a, a total out-of-body experience. And so you, as a superstar, are a conduit through whom these songs write themselves, through whom your performances dance themselves. And that's coming from the second self inside of you. And that's coming from a processing of an experience of a whole range of generational experiences that are new to your generation that you have in common with the people in your audience. And that second self is processing them and then is sharing them with your audience in a way that gives your audience for a second a sense of validity, a sense that it's not alone, a sense that it's not crazy. Um, and validates the second self inside of them. And that's part of what happens in some cases to make a superstar. So what is that? Is that that is a meme gestating within you the way that your food digests in the 30 feet of intestines within you. It gestates within you, and then it comes back up as a digestion of an experience that's totally unique to your generation. Why would your generation have a totally unique experience, Sam? Because your generation experiences technologies in a way no previous generation has. Your generation, if it's your daughter's generation, they're growing up with smartphones, for God's sakes. They're growing up with iPads. They're growing up with laptops. If it's my generation, well, yeah, I grew up with computers from the age of 12, but that's because I was a science geek. Computers were the size of my entire building, my entire house here in Brooklyn um, when I was a kid. So that was really rare. And, and when Gary Marcus's generation, the cognitive psychologist, came along, Gary's 30 years younger than I am or something like that. Well, that means he grew up with Atari's and he grew up with Commodore 64's and he grew up with basic as a programming language these are things that were not available to my peers when I was a kid growing up and in fact when my mother was kind enough to spring for a kit I begged her for to make it to build a computer it was a kit for a boolean algebra machine and it wasn't even digital it worked with big wheels that have <laughs> multiple contacts so so what Gary grew up with, what Gary grew up, Gary Marcus grew up with, microprocessors, those didn't exist 
when I was helping co-design a computer at the age of 12. Microprocessors did not exist, um, nor did the kind of programming languages that we know today, nor did the concept of digital. That was only that. Yeah, it existed at uh, in the military, where they had access to some of the few computers at the time. Ten years later, it would exist for airlines, which were the first to be able outside of the military to afford these gigantic computers. But outside of those two tiny little spheres, digital wasn't there yet. So every generation grows up with a whole new flood of tools of empowerment. And these tools of empowerment are like arms and legs. Your daughter's cell phones are like their arms and legs. If they have iPads, they're like their arms and legs. And they're tools for right. the transmission of memes, right? The transmissions of memes. And while people, while some people drive me crazy, yes, they're tools for the transmission of memes. And it drives me crazy when people say, why are we so obsessed with these material possessions? Hey, dumbbells, these are not material possessions. You do not buy a smartphone for the seven and a half extra ounces of plastic and metal that it puts in your pocket. You buy it because it's a tube, it's a conduit, it's a pipe, and it's a pipe to other human beings. And how do human beings communicate with each other? Through memes, through cliches. The strongest toolkit we have is our toolkit of cliches. When you, in the days when you were still single, when you used to get into a fight with your girlfriend and you got all upset and you didn't want to tell your friends about it because you didn't want to look weak, but you needed to tell somebody about it, you'd call your best friend in Hawaii, your best friend from high school, and the two of you would talk. One part of your brain, the limbic system down here, was using a, a, communica a communications device to communicate with a friend uh, 3,400 miles away in order to communicate with another part of your brain, the left prefrontal cortex where the conscious self is located. That's a big trip to take, 7,000 miles round trip or more, just to connect this part of the brain to this part of the brain. Why was your friend so effective in, in, in connecting the two? Because your friend ran through a toolkit of cliches and came up with one of the following. Well, she just needs her space right now. Or, well, you need to let her know you just need your space right now. Or, um... That's a toolkit of memes. Now, me, think of it from another point of view. You, Sam, get up in the morning. Let me just tell you this one. You get up in the morning, you go to the bathroom, and on your way, you frequently have an absolutely great idea. And it's so great that you know you're going to remember it. Well, by the time you get out of the bathroom, it's gone. That's a meme competing even to get from your gut gestation of new ideas level in the second self to the first self and doesn't even manage to make it to the first self in you. It doesn't, and, and once it does make it to the first self in you, it has to compete with a thousand, with a hundred thousand other ideas to get you to commit to putting seven years and all of your life savings into it. And then once you commit to putting seven years and all of your life savings into it, you're competing with millions of other people who've done the same thing. So there is a, there are a lot of levels of competition a meme has to get through before it becomes she just needs her space or there are a lot of fish in the sea. Let me ask you this. I think uh, I, I'm going to nudge you in a little different direction, but I think this sort of builds on what we're talking about. And this is a podcast for people who are concerned about sales and business and success. But I, I, you've written about this in the, in the past, I think, in the Wall Street Journal a couple times. Why is vision and an optimistic uh, vision so critical to success? It's not just critical. It's a life and death matter. Um, if you have a product that you want to sell, whether it comes from you or whether you are working on behalf of somebody else, your first step is to believe in it. Your first step, is, I mean, if it's not a product you can believe in, you shouldn't be working with it. But your first step is step outside yourself, step outside your prejudices, step outside the way your friends would think of you for being associated with this. And even if it's a product your friends would despise, look at it as if you've never seen it before and then proceed from there. List all of the things that are bad about it and all of the things that are good about it. And if the goodness in it merits your time, then continue. If it doesn't merit your time, find something else to do. When you get up in the morning, you have to believe in that product. If you're in the position of sales, which is the most important position of all, 
Without sales, nothing succeeds, including your own ideas. So you are always in the position of sales. And if you are in the position of sales, when you were, by the time you approach somebody else, you have to know the arguments on behalf of your product, even if the product is you, by heart, period. They have to come easily to your lips. But when people are measuring what comes from your lips, they're not going to be measuring the content of what you say. First, they're going to measure the confidence in what you say. So be damn sure that before you make a sales call or visit somebody or try to convince a friend of something or try to convince a girlfriend of something, that you convinced yourself of it. And if necessary, go to somebody, call somebody, talk to somebody who's an easy sell. Talk to a friend of yours who always reassures you. And then once your mouth is up and running, once you've got your energy going, once you've warmed up your motor, then try somebody who's more difficult and outside your circle. And once you've done it once or twice with somebody outside your circle and you're really warmed up, call the most difficult person on your list immediately. Don't <laughs> allow yourself to procrastinate. Because within two hours, your energy and the length will be gone. And by then, it will be too late. And without, without winning some of the most important people on your list, you will fail. And remember that for every 100 people you talk to, only 10 are going to be responsive. And for every 10 who are responsive, only one is going to come through. So put a, at least 300 people on your target list, if not 1,000. Um, persistence pays. One day, um, well, it was the summer after my freshman year of college. I wanted a job for the summer in writing and editing, the stuff that I really loved doing. It was a necessary part of my science to be a good writer. And so I wanted a job in editorial. I went through the New York Times, listed every agency that was offering jobs in editorial. Uh, there were a 100 of them. I called the first 98, and I got no's, absolute definite no's. When I got to the 99th, they had a job for me. If I hadn't persisted through the first 98, I never would have gotten to the 99th. So those are some key tools of selling are key tools of a medic of spreading memes. And you can't spell, spread memes without confidence. If people sense your lack of confidence, they will never listen to your arguments. And that's why vision and optimism. Well, I mean, you have to be optimistic to make that 99th call, don't you? I mean, you have to have some level of belief. Well, you have to have some level of belief. You're going to be, by that time, you're going to be very depressed, but you have to keep pushing yourself anyway. And you have to have your three by five card in front of you with the sales points to keep reminding yourself. And yes, if you can't, if you cannot, um, uh, marshal, um, a degree of enthusiasm, um, then you're in all probability going to fail. Um, people read your confidence over the phone, and they'll read your lack of confidence over the phone. Now, there are going to be rare occasions where if you have no confidence whatsoever in something, but you've memorized the pitch, that somebody's going to see a value in the pitch that you don't have. But that's because that other person has vision. The vision thing is about knowing your product so well that you can see beyond what anybody else can see in it that you can see what its ultimate possibilities are. And, and the value of things is in their utility to other people, what they can accomplish for other people. And believe me, there are tons of things in this world that can accomplish astonishing things. The cell phone accomplishes astonishing things. Android, the bugs the shit out of me, accomplishes astonishing things. My laptop accomplishes astonishing things. These are changed the very nature of what it means to be human. And if you're working with a product, hopefully you're working with a product that can do the same in some small way. Tell me what makes someone tell me what makes someone influential to other people. Remember the two selves. There's the, the self that's the, on the emotional level digesting things that really makes a lot of the big decisions. And there's the self on the conscious level that uh, makes lists of things, divide things up into categories, comes up with names for things. To be persuasive, you have to have both of those memes. It sounds ridiculous to say this, but in alignment. Your passionate self has to know this is of value. And your reasonable self, your rational self, your, think, your, your thinking and talking self has to know the fucking talking points. 
It has to know how to articulate those things that will be of value. And both of them have to be working for you when you're talking to somebody else. And you can be very persuasive. What is charisma about? Charisma is about having the second self in alignment with the first self. It's about having the self below the floorboards of the self absolutely thoroughly behind somebody like uh, something like a linebacker or, or like an entire football line that you just can't get through that won't quit. And knowing all the arguments, upside down, intimately, backwards and forwards, in other words, being able to express them. And if you need to memorize the pitch points once you've accumulated the pitch points, then go through them backward, forward, inside out in every conceivable order. Because if you only remember them in the order that you have on your 3 by 5 cheat sheet, your 3 by 5 card, you'll never remember them when under fire. And, but if you know them in every conceivable order, every permutation and combination, you are very likely to be able to remember them under fire. Give me one more quick story. Tell me about the hardest sale you had to make when you were selling an artist. If you can think back to the PR days, and I know I don't remember your whole portfolio at the time, but I think you had ZZ Top at one time, Prince at one time, John Cougar Mellencamp, uh, ZZ, ZZ Top, Top, yeah, Aerosmith, ZZ Mellencamp, artist, but no, Mel, yeah, I had Aerosmith and Kiss and Queen. I had. Michael Jackson and Prince and Bob Marley and ACDC and Aerosmith, Kiss Queen, Run DMC, Billy Joel, Billy Idol, Paul Simon, Peter Gabriel, um, Bette Midler, um, um, a whole bunch of like that. And I, I, I liked to take on hard sells. Um, I liked to take on things that people hated. Wh which was um, the artist that was hardest valid. to get over? Which was the, the artist that was yeah. hardest for you to get moving and get, uh, get some uh -huh. traction with? John Mellencamp had gotten into a car in um, Indiana, driven all the way to New York City, felt that if he was signed by the same manager who managed uh, David Bowie, that he would be a star. And sat day after day, apparently, in Tony, in what's his name's office, in the office of the manager for David Bowie, um, Tony, what was his name, and at any rate, and eventually got signed. And then Tony, the brilliant manager, made a huge mistake. The mistake was that he was going to introduce John to the press by compiling a list of all of the major press people who did a big difference, the alpha sheep in the press, the alpha chick. Because if you got an alpha sheep in the press, if there was a pecking order, um, everybody, the beta followed the alpha, and everybody else followed the beta and the alpha. Um, so he, he had one of the most influential people in the business make a book. It was a gorgeous coffee table style book with each of the most influential people in the press, a big picture and a little capture, capsule bio. Well, this made the press people feel like they were being bought. And they don't like being bought. They pride themselves on their independence. They like finding things, not having something that's found shoved down their throat. And they, this whole thing inspired a hatred of John Cougar Mellencamp, and of all people, the Alpha Sheep in the press brigade. And the press convinced itself that John Cougar Mellencamp was a little piece of shit, that he had a ghastly personality, and he made ghastly music. So step number one in selling John Cougar Mellencamp was to study everything John Cougar Mellencamp had ever said and everything he had ever written for a month. Step number two was to go out to his home and insist on being with him, with his, without his wife, without his manager, with nobody in the room but him and me. Step number three was to dig into John Cougar Mellencamp and find that self below the floor, floorboards of the self that does write the lyrics, that does dance him when he's on stage. He's one of those powerful performers you will ever see in your life. And that gave me the pitch. That gave me the stuff that was of value, that was of genuine value, overwhelming value in John Cougar Mellencamp. And I spent the next three years taking beta or alpha sheep in the press out to lunch, one by one, telling them the stories behind the songs, the stories of a very powerful and unique life growing up in Seymour, Indiana, that was different from any other teenage life I'd ever heard of and they'd ever heard of anywhere on the planet, and showing them how that life manifested itself in the lyrics. 
Then for three years, they told me I was full of shit. Now, they didn't tell me that. They were very polite. And, <laughs> and believe me, those lunches went on until long after every table at the restaurant was empty because the stories were amazing, amazing stories. And every year I went out to be with John again, know what his new album was. I went out having seen the lyrics already to interview him about who he was that year because every year we all change. And every year we're reflecting the changes in our generation without knowing it. We think these are unique personal experiences. It turns out we're speaking for an artist on behalf of many, many others. And if we're a salesperson, we're speaking on behalf of many, many others. The secret sells that the people have articulated. So after three years of this, steadily being told what shit John Mellencamp was, um, John came to Radio City Music Hall and did a performance. And, and Sherry Ring, the publicist from Polygram Records, and I got all of these press people that I have been hammering at for all of these years to the performance. And when the performance was over, two of the hardest cells, um, Timothy White, who at the time was a uh, regular contributor to Rolling Stone. He had been a major um, rock and roll journalist for AP. He would eventually became, become the editor of Billboard. Timothy White came up to me, took my two arms in his fists like this, and said, and looking directly into my eyes from a distance of this far away, said, you were right, you were right, you were right. And then Vic Garbarini was the editor of Guitar Magazine, or Guitar Player Magazine, and who was a very important intellectual influence within the press brigade. Another alpha sheep did exactly the same thing, came up, took me by the arms without having seen that Timothy had already done it, looked me again in the eye from a very short distance away and saying, I don't believe it. You were right. The sky is utter, utterly amazing. And that's the day that turned the tables. It took three years of preparing the ground perceptually. When we talk about perception, we're talking about memes. That was American Fool? we're talking about vision. That was uh, God knows what. I'm, I'm terrible with album titles. And I have no idea what album we were up to at that point. It was my third album in all probability working with Mellencamp. But that was it. That was the first time it took me a full three years. I turned people around with ZZ Top much faster than that. But that was because we had bigger budgets and because ZZ Top's management uh, had a very good PR sense. And so it was not just me. It was Bob Small working at ZZ Top's management office plus Bill Hamm. ZZ's house manager backing us. So when we were able to take a whole press crew to Texas with us, that was a trip too good for anybody to turn down. And they saw ZZ Top's, they began to see ZZ Top's power. And when you have people captive in an airplane and you can sit next to somebody for five hours of flight and tell them the story, then the, 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 the scales fall away from their eyes. I learned a lesson when I was 16 years old. My high school literature teacher was trying to get us to read T.S. Eliot. And I, I loved poetry. It was profoundly important to me. And I read T.S. Eliot over and over again, and I was sure that it was a pile of crap. He was throwing around so many Italian phrases, so many Greek phrases, so many Latin phrases, that nobody of intellect way up there in the intellectual critics brigade would dare challenge him because they all were afraid that the reason they didn't understand him was because they weren't smart enough. And none of them would confess to not being smart enough to understanding something. So I felt it was a shell game that T.S. Eliot was playing. And then one day I picked up a book called Axel's Castle. And in Axel's Castle, the author gave me in two paragraphs the key, the perceptual key, to T.S. Eliot. And all of a sudden, I understood everything that I've been laboring so hard to denigrate, um, to attack. Um, and P.T.S. Eliot became one of my two favorite poets. So my task as a publicist was to find the perceptual keys. And my task as a scientist is to find the perceptual keys that will get the scales to fall all the way from your eyes so that you will see the reality inside of you and the reality around you from a radically new point of view. Perceptual keys are it. And if you're trying to sell somebody on something that's valid, perceptual keys are extremely important. 
but it can take hammering, 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 hammering before the perceptual key strikes home. Howard, you are before amazing. Before it opens the lock. You are amazing. Thank you for being here. Can I bring you back to do well, this again? Absolutely. You know I love doing these things with you. And that, my friends, is Howard Bloom. You can find Howard at howardbloom.net. As always, you can find me at thesalesblog.com. Make sure you sign up for my Sunday newsletter. And until then, I'll see you next week in the arena.